here at the New Yorkshire Museum and it's my absolute pleasure to share with you our, well, our most fantastic and exciting new acquisition, the Rydale Roman Horde. You're joining us for the second of a series of online lectures which celebrate this fantastic Horde and celebrate the exhibition that we've recently opened at the Yorkshire Museum which explores this hoard and its burial. I'll remind you at the end um, in case you've forgotten but uh, do join us for the rest of the talks in the series. Um, but yeah, now on to the, the star of the show, the Rydale Horde itself. In this talk, I'm going to talk to you for about 20 minutes and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. So please do add your comments, questions and thoughts in the comments box there on YouTube and we'll get to them at the end of the session. I'm going to talk to you about the interesting story of discovery of this hoard and its interesting journey to the Yorkshire Museum. We'll then look at the objects themselves, each in turn, look at their detail, talk about how they were made and also how they were used in Roman Yorkshire. We'll then look a little bit at the context of burial, the most mysterious part of this story, and discuss why these objects might have been buried together in a field in North Yorkshire some 1800 years ago. Right, let's talk about the discovery of this hoard. These objects were found by two metal detectorists. Their names are James Spark and Mark they were detecting in a field near Ampleforth in the Rydale district of North Yorkshire back in May of 2020. I think they were detecting on a sunny Sunday afternoon. James received a signal on his detector and upon investigation uncovered the first object that was found in the hoard. This beautiful horse and rider figurine, don't worry we're going to come back and look at it in more detail later. Rather than immediately realising what he'd found and the significance and age of it, he actually put it to one side, thinking that it was a cast-led Victorian toy of a horse and rider, a much more common metal detecting find, with some similarities to this object. However, when Mark and James looked at the object more closely later, they soon realised that it was much older more significant and special than that. And over the subsequent day, the other four objects that make up the Rydell Horde were discovered. They were all found in close proximity in a single field, either in the same hole or close, closely nearby. That coupled with their similar date and the similar what we call patination across the surface of the copper alloy, which is the material that these objects are made of, very much suggests that these all went into the ground at the same time. They were buried intentionally as a hoard. And what does the term hoard mean? Well, hoarding is a practice that people have undertaken throughout history. In fact, here at the Yorkshire Museum, we even have a hoard of flint axe heads that dates back to the Neolithic period. And people intentionally gathered their wealth, their belongings, objects together and buried them in the ground for a number of different reasons. One of those reasons is for security. Before the invention of banks, actually burying your treasure or your um, belongings was a means of security, especially in chaotic times, perhaps during times of warfare in the region. And it's definitely the case that many of the hoards in the Yorkshire Museum's collection date from these periods of upheaval. However, hoards can also have more symbolic and religious reasons for their burial. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the reasons that the Rydell hoard may have been buried a little bit later. So as soon as they found this hoard and realised the importance of it, they recorded their finds with the Portable Antiquities Scheme. They got on the phone to their local finds liaison officer who was able to record these finds in minute detail, take fantastic photographs of them and inform the museum and other interested parties that they've been found. The Portable Antiquities Scheme is a really, really important um, scheme that's run across England and Wales and administered by the British Museum. And its aim is to record 
all archaeological finds made by members of the public. So by metal detectorists primarily, but also by people who find um, objects in their garden, for instance, when they're doing a bit of gardening. And they record them, they identify what they are, how old they are, and they take detailed photographs and measurements. And all of this information is made freely available on a fantastic online website, finds.org.uk. Um, so do, after this talk, do go to finds.org.uk, search for where you live and see what archaeological finds have been made near your house. So, because, the, um, because of the materiality of the hoard, these objects are all made of copper alloy. They're not treasure in the official sense of the term. Treasure needs to be gold or silver or a certain number of coins, to put it quite simply. That meant that the the story and the, the root of these objects was not determined by any legislation. They could have quite easily been um, kept by the finders or perhaps disappeared into a private collection. But thanks to very generous donations and grants, notably from our friend in America, Richard Bellison, through um, help from American Friends of the Art Fund, Art Fund here in the UK and a number of other private donors, including Mark Story. We are very pleased to say that this object, um, these objects are now part of the permanent collection here at the Yorkshire Museum and will be on display for visitors to Yorkshire for many, many years to come. So, should we focus on the hoard itself? and see what all the fuss is about. Um, what I should say, and what I didn't say at the beginning, is just how significant these finds are. We're so excited to receive them here at the Yorkshire Museum because they transform our already nationally significant Roman archaeology collection. We have nothing like these objects that have ever been found before in Yorkshire, and they automatically become a star piece of the collection. Let's start with the face of the hoard so to speak, this fantastic bust of a male face. Um, let's have a look and explore the detail of this. So you can see from the size of my hands, my hands are quite small, but we've got about um, 10 to 15 centimetres in height. Made of cast bronze with this fantastic incised detail. Here on the beard, we have a forked beard and curling hair and a fantastically detailed moustache. We have these piercing um, lozenge-shaped eyes with these gaping holes that we think would have originally been infilled um, with some material, perhaps coloured glass. Similar examples, which I'll show you later, do have example um, do have eyes filled with coloured glass, or it could be enamel um, or even natural material like stone. Um, it's a fantastic object. It's not just any face either. This is the face of an Antonine emperor, an emperor of the second century AD. And we actually think that this is a particular Antonine emperor, Marcus Aurelius. This is based on careful consideration of the hair and the facial features and um, comparison to the few but important comparable finds of this type from Britain. This isn't just a bust. If I flip this figure over onto the reverse, you might be quite surprised by what you see. Actually, the figure is hollow, completely hollow, um, and there's this gap at the back here. Alongside this bust, this little scrap of thin copper alloy was discovered. Perhaps not something that you might immediately see and think archaeological find. However, you can see that this actually fits wonderfully onto the back of this bust. And this, when we look at the object from this angle, we can start to understand how it functioned. This is not just any old bust. We think this is a scepter head an ornamental terminal that would have sat atop a staff. So a wooden staff, we think, would have been inserted into this hollow area in the back and secured in some way by this copper alloy backplate. You can see here on the neck 
of the emperor, we have two rivets which secured the back plate in place. And then further at the bottom here, on the chest of the figure, we have three holes for missing rivets, which again attach this bust to something, and perhaps that something was a staff. So what is a, what is a staff and who might have used it? Well, scepters, scepter heads and staffs were part of a, a group of objects that are known as priestly regalia. They're the equipment of Roman religious priests, the equipment that would have been used in religious rituals and ceremonies. And scepter heads would have been the focus of worship and ritualised movement in ceremonies. The, um, the, um, excuse me. The um, subject, my words are escaping me on this uh, Thursday afternoon, the subject of this scepter head, being an emperor, we think likely Marcus Aurelius, tells us what kind of ritual um, practice would have been focused at this object. This would have been used by a priest of what is known as the imperial cult, the worship of the emperor as a god. Um, and we know that the imperial cult was worshipped across the Roman Empire. We have inscriptions dedicated to emperors. We have st monumental statues of emperors, including the fantastic marble head of Constantine that was found here in York. And we also know that these priests of the imperial cult, known as Severe Augustales, were operating in our region. We know this actually um, through inscription evidence. So Roman objects that have been inscribed with writing, which provides us with such a wealth of information. And we actually get the insight into the life of one such priest of the imperial cult who worked in York through a particular object. Now I've got a photograph of this object here. It may be a little bit difficult to see, but I'll pop it here in case, in case we can pick it up. This is an altar, an inscribed altar. Um, very typical Roman artefacts that would be um, erected and um, honoured to gods as a thanks for a, a bargain fulfilled and a prayer answered. Now, this isn't just any old altar. Um, this is an altar that a priest of the imperial cult Known as um, whose name was Marcus Aurelius Lunaris, erected in Bordeaux, actually, in France, nowhere near York, as thanks for a successful journey across the now English Channel. Thanks to Marcus Aurelius Lunaris providing fantastically detailed inscription on this altar, we know that he was a priest of the imperial cult operating in York and Lincoln, two very important Roman centres in the north of Britain. Because of the information on the, um, and the inscription, notably detailing which consuls were in power in the year that the altar was put up, we can date it to the year AD 237, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, the priests of the imperial cult um, were taken from the ranks of... Um, Roman wealthy businessmen who held these roles, interestingly, alongside their normal business interests. The fact that Marcus travelled from northern Britannia to Bordeaux might suggest that his um, business was in, uh, was in wine making and transportation. So we can build up a fantastic picture of a priest of the imperial cult from that single object. But this is just such a spectacular, spectacular object that we have nothing, um, nothing to compare to it in the collection. Its subject, Marcus Aurelius, was leader of the Roman Empire from the year 161 to 180. We don't know whether this bust was commissioned during his lifetime. It's perhaps more likely that it was commissioned upon his death upon his deification to the, um, to the role of a, a god in the Roman, um, in the Roman um, plethora of gods. Let's move on, there's plenty more to discover. The second object in the hoard, and the one that was discovered first, is this beautiful 
and detailed figurine of a horse and rider, again cast in one piece in copper alloy. And you can see the spectacular detail here. We have a figure straddling a horse who is wearing a crested helmet, a pleated tunic, a belted tunic and a pleated kilt. However, if you look at the detail of the horse, that's perhaps the most significant. You can see the bridle bit and bridle parts around the face. And then these decorative discs on the haunches here. A beautiful little object. And actually, this figurine is incomplete. The warrior on horseback would have held a shield in his left hand and brandished a spear in his right. There's also a little bit of damage to the feet here. You can see that it's been broken, probably in antiquity, based on the condition of the brakes here. If I attract your attention to this particular hoof, you can see that there's a small peg extending from the bottom. And this shows that this object would have been slotted into a flat base so it could sit flat. It doesn't need the intricate museum mount that it now does. Now, the subject of this figurine is actually the god Mars, the Roman god of war. He's perhaps depicted a little bit differently to how you may have seen him before. He's depicted not in the way that he would be depicted in Rome as a standing classical warrior in um, Roman generals' garbs. He's depicted as a, a warrior on horseback. And this is a typical way that Mars was depicted in Britannia and also in the province of Gaul. So a northern, um, a, a tradition in the Northern Empire. And Mars is depicted in this way in small figurines like this, of which around 25 are known from Britain, with complete cast examples like this being um, much, fine, much more finely executed. He's also known, um, he's also depicted in this form um, in small brooches um, showing a horse and rider. And it's thought that these small brooches functioned a little bit like medieval pilgrim badges and might have been distributed at shrines to the god Mars as a kind of indicator of a perhaps a successful pilgrimage or a visit to that shrine. Very, very interestingly, one such brooch of a horse and rider was found again by a metal detectorist just a few miles from the fine spot of the Rydale hoard. So bear that in mind when we're thinking about possible um, possible interpretations for the burial of this hoard. So we have a beautiful little statuette of the god Mars. Mars was a very, very popular god in Roman Britain, popular across the empire, but popular in Roman Britain because of the high military um, level of occupation here, especially in the north of the province. We're, of course, very close to the frontier of the vast Roman Empire, and Yorkshire and the north of England is dotted with many Roman forts and installations. There would have been many thousands of soldiers stationed here. They would be going to, um, through troubling times, worrying about going off to war and going on campaigns, perhaps even missing their family who might live of the empire. Um, perhaps this little figurine was owned by one of those soldiers based and stationed here in Yorkshire. They may have prayed to this figurine to give an offering of good luck when going into battle. Mars was particularly popular with the army, of course, because he's the god of war, but also he was seen to offer protection. So we can see that there's a lot of potential symbolism in this object here. Right, moving on to our third object. We have a beautiful figurine of half a horse, the front portion of a horse. And this is actually an incomplete key. This is the handle from a key. That might make a little bit more sense if I turn it over to this, to this profile here. You can see the iron stub, which is all that remains of the locking end of this key. This would have extended out to an intricate iron locking mechanism with teeth at the other end. The bronze is all that has survived. We don't know whether the iron, which is more liable to corrosion in the ground, um, rotted away in the ground, so to speak, to leave just the handle, 
Or perhaps this object went into the ground already having been broken. Perhaps even the breaking of this object might have been part of the ritual which culminated in the burial of this hoard. All very interesting hypotheses and questions to ask. We don't know why this object was included in the hoard. Was it just a, a nice object, um, a treasured object that somebody held dear? Was there some symbolism in the horse? It has been suggested that this key and the image of a horse might have been a stand-in for an animal sacrifice in this burial. It's an interesting idea. Keys also in the Roman period were wrapped up with all kinds of magical and symbolic symbolism. So again, the key may have played an interesting part in the ritual which culminated in the burial of this hoard. And finally, onto perhaps my favourite object in the hoard, this plumb bob. Now, this is perhaps not the most beautiful or stunning object in the hoard, and in fact, it is a utilitarian tool. Um, they're still, plumb bobs like this in very similar form are still used today. You might have something that looks very similar in your garage. They're essentially a weight. This is quite weighty um, and it would have been suspended using these holes for a long piece of twine. Because of the shape of it and its weight, it would of course hung vertical, created a plumb line from which um, other straight lines and engineering projects um, could be levelled. Now, they were used by Roman engineers, um, well, throughout the Roman world, individually, and also as part, in multiple, as part of a more complex tool called a groma. Um, and this functioned as a staff with a horizontal cross mounted to the top with four plumb bobs, one suspended from each arm of the cross. And Roman engineers would be able to use this to create straight lines across great distance. So they would use it to mark those long Roman roads, forts, fortresses and new towns. Now, as we say, this is a very functional utilitarian object. It's a tool. It's still beautiful. It's a large and fine example of a plumb bob. But it is functional. Why is it buried with these other objects which either have such a strong religious significance or may do? And really, it's the inclusion of this plumb bob in the hoard which I think hints at the possible burial of these objects. So let's move on to um, why these objects may have been buried together. They, there are a number of reasons, as we touched on, why hordes were buried in the past. Even though we've dwelt over the significance of these objects, looked at these objects in fine detail today, and treasured them in a fantastic museum display case, perhaps in the second century AD, the owner of these objects saw them as scrap bronze. There's a chance that this might be a metal worker's hoard of material which has been gathered together with the intention to melt down, reuse and recycle. Metal workers' hoards are well attested across Roman Britain. They often number tens of vessels. So it's a, um, it's a practice with lots of comparable examples. And the fact that these four objects are quite different, they, it's not immediately obvious why they were brought together, perhaps hints at a random collection of scrap bronze. Difficult for our um, modern minds to perhaps comprehend melting down Marcus Aurelius today. However, as we've explored the religious nature, well, the likely religious nature of some of these objects, hints at a more votive deposition for the hoard. It's likely that the act of burying the hoard had more symbolic meaning to the burier and to those involved. We can only wonder why that was, um, but I think that the plumb bob hints at the potential reason. Perhaps the plumb bob, being a utilitarian tool, hints at the act that um, this hoard was buried to bless. And plumb bobs were not just used for the building of roads and buildings, um, towns and infrastructure. 
They would also be used as part of land management, the rearranging of estates, perhaps the reorganisation of field systems, the establishment of your land around your new villa, perhaps. And if we think a little bit about where these objects were found, that might start to shed some light on the type of activity that could be happening in the second century in Yorkshire. So they were found near Ampleforth. Um, which is in the Rydell district of North Yorkshire. It's about 20 miles north of York, roughly. It's an area of beautiful countryside today, kind of straddling the Hawardian Hills to the south, the North York Moors to the north. And in the Roman period, again, it was an, a rural area. The nearest settlement was the Roman town of Olborough, which again is about 20 kilometres away to the southwest. However, what we do have in this area is likely roads extending from the main roads north to south and also a number of villas. So the fine spot of the Horde is surrounded by villa complexes that were developed in the Roman period. Each would have been not just a, a wealthy um, farmhouse, as sometimes we imagine villas, but working industrial and agricultural estates that would have had large um, areas of land surrounding them. In the Roman period, many aspects of work, business and everyday life um, had to be religiously and ritually sanctioned, including the establishment of boundaries, um, the building of, well, any kind of building project, roads or towns, they would have to be ritually sanctioned. And it might be that this hoard was buried um, to commemorate, to give blessing to an act of land management in which the plum bob was used. However, that's just one possibility, and we encourage visitors to the Yorkshire Museum when you come to see this hoard to explore the objects in the wider collection, hear about the different reasons why the Rydell Roman hoard may have been buried, and come to your own conclusion. We're coming towards the end, um, the end of the talk now, so I'm going to encourage you to add your comments and your questions into the comments box on YouTube and we can, um, we can have a little bit of a discussion. I'd love to hear what you think of these objects, perhaps which is your favourite, and crucially, I'd love to hear why you think these might have been buried. Were they buried by perhaps that priest of the imperial cult who probably used this object in rituals that honoured the emperor here in North Yorkshire, perhaps in Eberacum, Roman York itself? Maybe you think the hoard was buried by the soldier who may have owned this figurine of Mars. Perhaps it was buried um, as an offering to the god Mars in hope of protection before marching off on campaign to fight um, barbarians beyond the wall. Or perhaps the idea that this is a collection of scrap bronze has attracted you. Maybe. These were the lost materials of a bronze smith and they've very luckily missed out on being melted down. Or perhaps they were um, partly the tools of an engineer who ritually sanctioned um, an act of land management in Yorkshire. Incredibly intriguing object. Please do add your comments and questions if you have them. I'll flag that our brand new exhibition, The Rydell Horde, A Roman Mystery, is now open at the Yorkshire Museum. We were absolutely thrilled to welcome guests back to the Yorkshire Museum in April, and you can come and see our fantastic new exhibition. It's on until the end of March of next year, so absolutely plenty of time to come and see these fantastic objects. In the exhibition, you can expect to, of course, see the Rydell Horde itself and hear about its discovery through um, the stories of the finders, James and Mark, themselves. We're also utilising our fantastic Roman collections um, from York and North Yorkshire to explore each of these objects in more detail. But for now, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, do come to the Yorkshire Museum do see these objects for yourself and also join us for our 
wider series of talks and lectures. You can find more details of these and sign up to them online on our website. We've got one per month. Um, it's a mix of external expert lectures and then a deep dive and an up close look at objects from the exhibition. Thank you very much.